doing going just fine. You know, what are we gonna talk about now? We, Chris Bledsoe. Chris Bledsoe, my That's friend cool. Chris Bledsoe, who is now uh, today is actually Synchronicity. You want to know Chris Bledsoe? His book is being released today. It's being uh, brought out, and I'm not sure what he has in there in terms of uh, new stuff that I haven't heard. He hasn't had a book out yet, though, has he? No, no I did. I did. Uh, we did. Um, um, you did the cover for it. Um, uh, Alien bedtime stories. Oh yes, yeah. So he's in Alien bedtime stories. I think it was about 2014, 2015. So mm -hmm. I was writing about Chris Butzo long before anybody yeah, else that's was. Right. That's right. And I guess I sort of helped make him a little bit famous because I talked about him every time I had a chance I got. Because mm -hmm. there was a real deal, and that was the deal was that I met him in 2012. It's probably no, at a conference which was called a big, it's sort of like a conspiracy conference. It was called the Gathering. The Gathering. And it was run by a guy by the name of Larry Fusjeta. And Larry Fischetta had sold, uh, I believe, um, uh, one of these loan shark things, you know, not loan shark things, these, uh, where you get the loan, payday loan things. Mm. He had this franchise across the US, and he sold it for millions and millions and millions and millions and millions. So they called him Larry the Loan Shark. <laughs> and he was big in the UFOs, him and his brother. More him than his brother. And um, so he had a conference in 2012, and all he did was invite all these people to his conference, like all the top researchers, uh, Dolores Cam was there, John Alexander was there, I was there, Linda Howe was there, it was like everybody. And then he would bring in paranormal people, like you know, ghost people and stuff like that. And basically he was just the idea where if you're a rich guy, you can just hire a bunch of people, bring them in for a weekend, and pay their expenses, pay them 3,000 bucks a day and uh, just sit and chat with them and pick their brain, like you know, Kate Green or Jacques Vallée or whatever. And uh, so that's what he's doing. He's brought these people in, and it was like, what are we doing? Like, what, what's this conference about? And it's like, oh, he's paying all, uh, you know, f uh, high, high level hotel, and your flight's all paid, and uh, your food is all paid. You don't have to pay for anything when you're there, nothing. And it's like, yeah, okay. So we're going to this thing, and everything. Like, what's going on there? Like, and he sent us this questionnaire thing, had these different questions about UFOs and life. You know, spiritual stuff and stuff like that. And just to all the speakers, he sent the questions. Yeah, yeah. To, there were speakers, no speeches. There's no speeches. We were just going to this place. Oh, right. And, and so we, we get there, and and so I filled out this thing, and and uh, it turned out what it was was he just brought these people together, and he had one dinner. We had to go to this dinner, and it was 250 people. So there was about, and he bring in the wives too. So there was maybe 80 people he brought in, maybe 100. Hundred people or whatever with the wives and whatever, and um, then he brought in his family, and he's Italian, first eh? <laughs> generation. He's Italian, so his whole Italian family was there. It was like you know, like, like a big Italian <laughs> family gathering or something. You know, two hundred and fifty people. So half were these with all these UFO people. Out there and, all. and it was sort of like, see, I'm not crazy. And it's sort of like, so this was, that's how he realized what he was doing. He so he starts these questions. Who's going to answer these questions? And uh, so it was, I, got, I got the top 30s in the world here. I brought them all in to the world, and my family, now you're going to listen, show I'm not crazy, look at all these experienced people. And nobody answered these questions. So I started answering these <laughs> questions, you know. And I'm thinking to these people, like, what the hell's wrong with you people? The guy flew you in, paid all your expenses, at least you could like, volunteer to answer a question or something, you know. Like, nobody was answering these questions. And so uh, that, that's what he basically did. Is he what was, were some of the questions? Well, there were like uh, questions on UFOs, and there was spiritual questions about. I'm not sure. Green, I don't you know if he even got still got the questions, but there were that kind of weird thing where it was sort of like to defend to his family that you know there's all this stuff, and these people are all reincarnations of family. You think that's why he did it? it was to prove yeah. To his family. Well, I think that was a bit part of it. Yeah. Hmm. Because all we did, we went to these big huge cocktail parties. So it'd be this big huge cocktail party, and we'd all walk in, and it's like, what are you supposed to do? We just did, did, did walk they around like, and talk uh, to each other. They wear like black robes and have like masks. And Pyramid symbols on the other. <laughs> no, no, no. no we, just, we just walked around the room and you said, like, you know what's going on? And no, no, I don't know what's going on. And it's like, okay, and have another drink and eat. And then you go back to the hotel and then the afternoon do it again and walk around and talk to people. So, Chris, I met Chris, so we, we were at the. Chris was there? Yeah, Chris was there. So, he brought in Chris oh. and he brought in Diane Pasolka. And that, oh, is that where you met Chris? Yeah, that's where I met him. So, Diane Pasolka had discovered him, eh? So, mm -hmm. Diane Pasolka is a synchronicity thing. She had gone to a lecture that he was giving in. Um, in uh, Asheville, North Carolina, I think, uh -huh. and that's where he, he was talking about the UFO and the abduction stuff, and he started talking about the lady, 
which is the important part of the story to him. Right. This lady with the with the message and stuff. And then these people started to rise and said, Hey, what are you about some stupid lady? Tell us about the abduction. Because of, because of the religious connection or overtones that it had to it, I think. Yeah, but the, the UFO people didn't want to hear about some religious aspect of UFOs. But a lot of other Chris Chris theologians like Pasolka got interested in the case. Yeah, she, they, someone said to her, oh, this guy's talking about your... She was doing uh, sightings in the sky by Roman Catholic mm -hmm. symbols in the sky. It's just, that's not, it's not UFOs. No, 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 it's not. It's, uh, you know, saints and whatever they, you know, stuff that, that Christian... Uh, Roman Catholics believe in miracles and stuff like that. Like the, the these girls in 1911 or whatever that saw the sun. The, the, the Fatima case. case. So it was her, she was doing that kind of stuff. And they said, this is UFO stuff. No, it's not. It's not UFO stuff. So she goes to this guy. He, he sounds just like you. And so she went to this lecture. And that's how she met him. So he brought in Pasolka and he brought in um, Chris Butzo. So she discovered him and realized this guy was something. And so she starts to investigate him. She starts asking him questions and stuff. So she comes, and then uh, I met her, and Yvonne was there with him, his wife. And I still remember, uh, I didn't really know who Chris was. I just knew that everybody was around this guy. You know, there was all of them around this guy, like he was some, you know, rock star or rock star or something. I go, well, what's going on here? And then she was right behind me on the bus, and all these people were gathered with Chris sitting on the back side of the bus there. And there's like these big, you know, motor push buses. And they're moving us from the airport to the, to the hotel. And um, so Yvonne was sitting behind me and she shows me her cell phone. Oh, I'm not really into this. This is Chris's deal. I, I'm not really into this guy's stuff. See my daughter here? She's a, she sings, watch her this. And she's doing a top dance or something like this. You know, this is, She's all proud of her daughter because uh, this is her big deal. And her daughter did go and she's now a lecturer in music or something like this at New York University or whatever. So she did go that route. But the, the wife wasn't really interested. So I really didn't know who Chris was. So we were... We were there at the uh, event, and I sort of learned a little bit about his story, but I still didn't know who he was. And there was John Alexander and people at the table, and they're all around Chris or whatever. And I was with his wife, and my girlfriend was with me at the time. And, and uh, I still didn't really know what to, what, what to really do. I was sort of wandering around, like, what are we doing here? And uh, so then what happened was 2013, that's when the citizens' hearing thing happened. So I was in Washington, D.C., and then Paula Harris had asked me to lecture in Florida. So that's along the coast. So I say, okay, so I'll, it's the very next weekend. So I said, okay, what I'll do is I'll go to the citizens hearing. I'll rent a car in Washington and I'll drive down to Florida and then I'll drive back to Washington, drop off the car and fly home. So, and then I look and, well, Chris, Chris lives right off the highway, off Highway 15 going down to Florida. So that's why I contact him the first time. I say, hello, Chris, I'm coming through uh, North Carolina. I'm right near your place. Can I... Uh, can I stop in and see you? And by then I'd learned about the burning tree, that he had this burning tree in his backyard, this story of the burning tree. So I went there and he was very hospitable. He took me and showed me where the abduction had taken place and uh, told me the whole story. And, she, and they you know, introduced me to all the kids and the kids were bringing their friends around and stuff like that. And um, so then this is when the first event happened, this bizarre event. What year was that? 2013. 13. Same, it was right after Sis's hearing, the week after right. Sis's hearing. So... I'm heading for Florida, and that's when the, this event takes place. That's actually in, if he does have a movie, it's going to be in the movie. It's in the book for sure. And he sees it as a critical event in the, he sees it all as a story that unfolded, that God or whoever gave him this story. And he's playing out this role of this messenger to the world, and it's all unfolding. And I'm part of this story that was part of this. And it may, it may be, because it was a very bizarre thing that happened. So I go there, and we're sitting there, and we're playing on Facebook. And his wife was gone, and the one kid went to get a haircut, and everybody was gone. It was just me and Chris sitting there, and we were playing on Facebook. And I'm getting ready to go, and I'm taking a watch, going, oh, okay, and I'm waiting, and all of a sudden I hear Chris say, What are you doing back in the room? And I look, and there's three dogs. There's a big, huge dog, Black Lab. Nelly was a big Black Lab. And then there was this medium sized Heinz 57 dog. Then there was this little tiny 12. So it was like big, you know, it's three dogs. And they're sitting there in the middle of the room, and they're staring, staring up at us. He said, how'd you get back in the house? And then we get up and we go and I follow him and we go to the front door. The front door's wide open. And he said, get up, get up, get up, get up. And he closes the door or whatever. And then I said, oh, Chris, I got, I got to leave, you know. So then uh, I get to Florida and there's an email on my email when I get to Florida. And he said, you know what happened twice more after you left? I, I, I went back in the living room and then they're back in the room again. And I went, the front door was wide open again. So I put them outside, and I closed the door, and I went to the bathroom, and I came out of the bathroom, and they're back in the house again. And I thought, 
he left that door open. <laughs> there was something, he left the door open. I go, what, what? you know, it's crazy. It didn't make any sense. And then, so then when I go back, and this is where it sort of fits in that you see what the phenomenon may be doing. It does this sort of, it's talking to you, but in a, sort of a, an absurd way. Mm -hmm. So I get back and it's, I said, I want to take some more pictures of the tree. So I take some more pictures of the tree. I've got the camera, I'm looking up inside the tree, you know, because there was all these stories about the branches had broken off. The tree had died. I don't know if you know that part of the story. The, the, the tree had died. Half the, there's a UFO ring under the tree in 2008. The event happened in 2007. 2008, this ring appeared. And the top, the tree is supposed to be 150 feet high. It's only 75 feet high. The top half of the tree just died. It's branches falling off and stuff. Mm -hmm. And the oak tree, when the when the being had come out of the forest, he had had his hand against this oak tree, and the being was standing there, and the, he was looking at this little being with the like encased in glass with the red eyes, and he said, "Oh, you got me." And he he could touch it. He was so close he could touch it. He's leaning against this oak tree. That tree completely died. All the branches fell off, it just completely died. Wow. And so this was happening to the other tree, and they figured, oh, this, this happened to the other tree now. But half it died, and so what was happening was that the branches were sort of broken on halfway up, and the bottom half of the tree, top half of the tree was gone. So when this fire started, the tree was coming out these branches on the top, like a volcano. <laughs> it was what? coming at the top. Wow. And it was so bizarre. So I'm, I'm photographing, I'm trying to get a photograph up through the tree. Uh, and um, then we walked to the porch. And that's when this bizarre event happens. That's in the movie. It'll be in the movie, and it's in the book. And that is, we're standing there, and Nellie's in behind us, and she's chewing on this gourd. She's got this gourd. She's chewing on this Nellie, gourd. Nellie, the dog. Which dog was that? The lab. The, the big black lab. Yeah. And she's lying on the grass right behind us. So we're on the concrete porch, and she's right on the edge of the porch on the grass, and she's chomping away there. And uh, so then, all of a sudden, he says, "Well, let's go in the house. Do you want to go to the house?" I said, "Yeah, sure." So we go to go in the house, and Chris is on this side, I'm here, and the dog wants to get in before me. You know? So the dog's coming on my side, and he's going racing by to get in the house, because he knows we're going to the house. And all of a sudden, I hear Chris say, Nelly, Nelly, what happened to you? And I look, and the, the dog is in, in the doorway, looking out at us, and the blood is <laughs> shooting up the dog's neck, you know, up off oh the walls God. and stuff like this. And I'm going, so immediately, when, when he told me on the email, said, oh, the dog, kept coming back in the house again. The door was wide open. I go, yeah, yeah. And as I said, this is weird. <laughs> and I had left the camera on the front seat. I don't know why, but it was almost like it was set up. It was on the front seat. I just opened the door, grabbed the camera, I go back, and I start photographing this. The dog is lying by him. Then he's got the dog he pulled out by the collar, and it's lying on the on this concrete patio. And he's he's got his hand, and he's got this, he, he, he said, Chris, get me a rag. So Chris quickly brings this rag. Oh, the girlfriend brought the rag. Chris put the rag down. The rag, you can see the rag is all full of blood and he's got it on the dog's neck. And um, then Chris Jr. comes out with this semi-automatic rifle. It's like he's going to take down Ben Laden or something. It's like, holy cow, just getting bolt out of the door with this rifle and holy shoot, you know. And, and he says, oh, that effing raccoon, I'm going to kill it. And I go, there's no raccoon. And he said, well, then that dog, I'm going to shoot the effing thing, you know. And I said, Chris, there was no dog. Chris Jr. I said, there's no dog. I mean, we're, we're, we're talking very honest. We would have heard if something bit the dog. Was the dog in pain? Did the dog no, see No, the dog was just lying there very calmly and just lying there and Chris had his hand. And then I said to Chris, I said, well, maybe you should take it to the vet, but he's losing blood. You know, we said, well, I'd be dead if I didn't get it to the vet. And then Chris lifted his hand up and the dog just got up wagged her tail and go running off and I go well, I go with the camera and I chase after the dog <laughs> and we're running around the front of the, the front side of the house and it barked at the front door once, and then it just went racing off into the front yard. You know, in the United States, they don't have any fences. Mm -hmm. So it goes run off into the neighbor's yard. It barked at the front door? What once. was it barking at? Nothing? Nothing. It just barked at the door. Bro! And then it went right, and racing across. And so <clears> then, uh, then I'm talking to Chris, and then we had this sort of a, a discussion about what it was. And Chris thought it was the shadow people. We had these two-dimensional shadow people that would go along the walls of the house. And they would go right into the next, they'd come to the corner of a wall, and they'd just go into the wall into the next room. And then had footprints in the ceiling. This is all poltergeist type stuff. You know, mm -hmm. Footprints in the, in, the, in the attic and stuff like that. And um, so I said, the, no, that was the shadow people. And he said, yeah, yeah, I think it was. And I said, well, why would you say shadow people? He said, well, they're evil. And I said, well, how do you know they're evil? He said, well, they're, they're dark. And I said, well, because well, they're dark doesn't mean they're evil. I said, you know what I think happened, Chris? And he said, what? I said, they know you're doing a movie. They know M M Mel Gibson wants to do a movie on this thing. And Julia Roberts wanted to play in this movie. It was going to play in this movie, and Mel Gibson was going to play Chris Bledsoe, and they want something for the movie. 
They want some <laughs> dramatic thing to put in the movie. The, the beings want to. And he said, no, no, I don't think so. No, it's not this. I said, yeah, Chris, I think it's not this. And then about two weeks later, he comes back and says, uh, you stop those uh, photographs you uh, took uh, at, the, uh, at the back door? And I said, yeah. Uh, Warner, Brothers, Warner Brothers would like to see them. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Eh? So, and then, and so then later, I didn't realize this thought, this last year, when he had the medal, I, I, I was pushing him on the medal. Like, why'd you get this medal? He had this picture of Barack Obama with his arm around this kid. And then I'm thinking to myself, he healed a kid, and I think he healed a kid, and that's where he got the medal, and it was from Camp David, and Obama had given him this medal and stuff like that. Because people were coming to Chris for healings. Yeah, because he's healed. And what mm -hmm. he said was that he had never been able to heal until that day with the dog. That he, that's mm -hmm. the first healing that he did was with yeah, the dog. Yeah, because he, he took the, the, the rag. And the dog mysteriously was fine. And, was... and he said they looked that night and the night after, him and his father, and they couldn't find a cut on the dog's neck. Wow. And so he believed that that's when he started healing people. And so that's part of he. So this is this, this, the way he's going to, he builds his story is this all builds to this point where the, with the dog with me and him, he starts to become this healer and he's got this message. And what happened was 2012, he had been taken twice. And I've discussed this last time. People still don't want to catch the significance of this is that my event happened, my consciousness event happened February 26, 2012. And Chris at one point was saying that that was the same day. He was the first time he was taken by the, the, the lady. So when they come to his room and they say, Arise! And he jumps out of bed, looks straight up. It's like, and these beings are in these hoods. And they're, they're energy beings in these hoods. And they, they tell him to get dressed and, and he goes downstairs. And they take him downstairs and they give him this thing to hold that's got the prickles on it. Oh, yeah. He doesn't know what to do with it. And he sticks it in the, in the, in the, in the uh, dog kennel to keep it safe. And then he looks up and this bull is coming, this 1,500 pound bull, and just runs him over. You know, this sort of a mythical, or a, you know, image bull, but knocks him right over. And he's lying on the ground with this wind, and, and, he, and he, he looks up to see where the bull has gone, and this, this lady is floating in the air, the most beautiful lady he'd ever seen in white with this gold, the sparkles, and the hair, and all this sort of stuff. And she's, she says, Chris, you have a burden, and it's yours to carry. And I said, well, you know what the burden is? He said, yeah, the burden is the message. I'm here to deliver a message to the world. And that happened. At one point, he said it happened the same day. Then later, he said it happened at Easter, which was maybe a few weeks after that. But Ray Hernandez, who also got involved with me, he had this experience where his dog is healed. So his wife is, is having all these UFO experiences and whatever. She says, it's all Jesus, not UFOs, it's mm -hmm. Jesus, Jesus, no, no. And he, he said, oh, whatever, you know, he doesn't pay attention. Big and, and then she Jesus asked for this dog to be healed. Mm -hmm. It's 15 years old, and then he comes down and stands there, and he says, ah, bullshit, and goes back to bed. 45 minutes later, he goes, what the hell? He goes right back down, and, and, and the dog is playing, and it's bouncing around. Because the dog was really sick before, I think. Yeah, right? it, was, it was paralyzed. Yeah. They were going to put it down the very next day, and he talked to the vet. And, and she thought day. the angels healed the dog. Yeah, healed, and and that was, was right at the same time? It was a week after my event. It was March the 5th, in my story, huh. February 26th. So all these events happened at the same time. These three story were free as this event. This sort of builds off where all these people start doing this consciousness thing. Chris Bledsoe starts his story, and I start my story, and they all branch off at exactly the same time. And Ray, I don't think, really sees the significance. To me, it's like, I think it's pretty significant all at the same time. So that's when I met Chris. And then, as it went on, he, he got these different offers. Like, he got the offer from Warner Brothers. And that's when I met this Tim Taylor guy, the, the guy from NASA, who was the, the guy who got the invention that supposedly sold on NASDAQ for $100 million, the company that, that this invention was part of. He was getting inventions from the beings, and he would do this protocol where he would sit in, this, in the light and drink, drink water, and he'd get these, he had 40 inventions. Mm -hmm. They were all medical inventions. I meet him, uh, there's a guy here in Winnipeg, Mark Olson is uh, a guy, and he's a big business guy. And he had invited his friend Mark Leon, who was a big business guy out of New Jersey. And we went to his cottage. He built this log cabin himself. Beautiful, beautiful log cabin. But five bedroom log cabin. And we went there, and um, Tim Taylor was there. And this is where I have this encounter with Tim Taylor about the jump room and all this kind of stuff. And uh, they're all, Chris is there. And Did that, you see you went with Chris? Chris was there. Everybody just showed up at this at this at this thing. And was, Tim Taylor knew Chris, and that's that was the connection there. Yeah. Plus, he also knew Mark. Mark. He, Mark had showed him where the where the gifting field was in, in New Mexico. 
He'd right. show him with his mouth. So there was all these connections. I'm the only guy, and, and me and uh, Peter Robbins, the only guys in the room didn't have any money. Everybody else was like a multimillionaire. Maybe not Chris, but Chris was being offered a million and a half dollars just to put his name on a piece of paper hmm. for the rights to his story from Warner Brothers. 2% of gross and 4% of royalties. And I remember these business guys saying, no, no, you're not taking royalties. No, no, they charge 20 bucks for a pencil. There's no, there's no royalties. You're not going to get any royalties. Take all the money up front. So they're all advising Chris on how to sign this contract with Warner Brothers on the, on the movie for his, for his story. This, again, is 2014, 2013. It's pretty early. So it's probably 2013. So, uh, but all Chris is worried about is, no, 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 no. He wants to control of the movie. And they, Warner Brothers say, no, he can't have control of the movie. No, no, that's why we're paying him a million and a half bucks. We control the movie. No, no, I need, it has to be called the message. And it has to end with the lady and stuff. And they're just like, you know, like, they don't want to say it, but <laughs> we ain't we're not selling that, man. We, 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 that's not going to get us our money back. They, they had done, they had done, that's where Diane Pasolka came from. Mm -hmm. Diane Pasolka had been the religious advisor on The Conjuring 1 and 2, right. which had done a billion dollars. In, in the box office. So she was this religious advisor to these script writers at Warner Brothers, and that's how they found out about Chris. So they bring in two guys who wrote The, the Conjuring, with these Chad and Carrie Hayes, these two script writers who spent years with Chris. You know, and they, they went through first draft, and the second, the lawyer signed, wouldn't sign up. And mm -hmm. they'd have and another that, draft. That's what has always, for me, made Chris seem really genuine. Yeah. The fact that he never he, sold out. He never sold out. Never and he wanted out. to have the story his way. So if he was just some guy making up some story about yeah. UFOs, you know, he would, why wouldn't he do that? Why wouldn't he take the money and, yeah. if that's what he wanted? Yeah, he had, this was the second time, second time around he was in the third lawyer when these guys were advising him. And they were talking about, you know, take the money up front and all this kind of stuff. And all he was worried about was, no, he wants to control the movie. He wants mm -hmm. to, and they actually did give him some sort of control. And then they went into production or something and he said, I'm on call. Uh, I'm, on, I'm on call for something, you know, to advise them or whatever. And then, I don't know what the reason why it fell apart, but then later on, Tom DeLonge tried to buy it up. So what Tom DeLonge is trying to do is Tom DeLonge is just trying to buy up stories. So he had this whole deal where he would have this app. So you'd have this app, and if you had a UFO sighting, you'd put it in the app. And it would tell you if there was sightings in the area, planes in the area, whatever, but it would go to Tom DeLonge. So if you said, uh, you know, I got abducted, and my wife, and we all got abducted, and uh, there was these big, giant things and they left us with a book and all this stuff, Tom Blong would own your story because mm -hmm. you put it in the app. And that's what Tom Blong was trying to do. So he was he was built up this thing and um, so he had bought up um, Lazar's story. He bought up the, the rights for Lazar's story and he was trying to buy up Chris Bletzel's story. And Chris Bletzel told me, I won't say how much money was involved, but it was a lot of money, production money that Chris turned down. And I still remember saying to me at the end of the conversation, he said, now there's a decision I had to make. Mm -hmm. And it was this idea like, people think I'm in it for money? This is what kind of money I was offered. But Tom Blong wanted to put Grays at the end of the movie. And Chris said, no, no, there's no Grays going to be in it. Mm -hmm. Not Grays, reptilians. You want to put reptilians in. And he said, no, no, there's no reptilians. It didn't happen. That's not going to go in the movie. And that's what Chris wanted. He wanted to control the movie. He didn't want them to turn it into a, you know, good guys, bad guys. Mm -hmm. would kill the aliens. And, the message was really important. Yeah, that was the whole thing. After all the stuff that Chris endured, the ridicule and his family deteriorating after his experience and stuff. And yeah, so now he's got the book, so it may be easier to get the um, the movie. But he told me a number of stories over the years. He talked to me about one where they had gone in, and I'm not sure he had the best business agents. I knew who they were, but I didn't think they were the greatest. But they had gone in, and they made a proposal for two years. And the guy that did Lost, the, the TV show Lost, was going to be the producer for it, big time. And they'd gone in, they'd written up for two years, and they got told, nope, we want five years. And they were to write up five years of, of scripts for this thing. And that was one. It was almost like, it was always like Chris said, oh, we're waiting next week, maybe it happen next week. It's the, the final sign off on this thing. And it went on like that for years. It was, mm -hmm. like, oh, yeah, it was like next year. And a lot of people thought he was just being dragged along by the government. I don't think that's true either, because the government, um, Chris would have told them whatever they wanted to know. They didn't have to sidetrack him or whatever. It was, mm -hmm. Maybe they were trying to kill the story by getting it signed up by somebody and, and dropping it. But uh, uh, to, me, to me, he was a, an interesting character, and he's, he's getting more historic as we go along. Like more people know who he is. More people realize he's... Um, 
the real deal. A lot of people don't like the religious aspect, but that's what I say in my experience with UFOs. And I started by just a guy who wanted to go see what people were looking at. And I say now it's going to be a lot less physical. Whatever this, I'm not sure what it is, but whatever this phenomenon is, it's a lot less physical than people think it's going to be. It's going to be way more spiritual, which is really going to piss some people off. And it's going to be a thousand times more complex than people think it's going to be. And as I say, the thing, another thing that will piss off people has not got a hint of capitalism. Not a hint of that's capitalism. Right. And, and that's where you have this, what I'm starting to get into now, is I, I've sort of branched off, because now I'm, I'm on these painkillers, which I sort of, I'm sort of dazed half the time. So I just sort of think about things. And the thing I've been working on now is this whole thing with swarm intelligence. And they're starting to work with it, like in, in DARPA and uh, business people. And this whole idea about an ant is very stupid, but when you put all the ants together, they're absolutely amazing what the, mm -hmm. the colony can do. And it's this idea of one versus, or uh, why do um, fish make a, a big school of fish? Right. And they have all these advantages and how they can move at the same time as all the others. And it's this swarm intelligence that when you develop the swarm intelligence, and what's that what you see on board a ship, like what Tom Long said, it's a hive mentality and we're going to kill these guys. And it is a hive mentality. It's this idea that they, you're more connected with other people, or this idea where you, you can get a nest where, say, you break the, the, the nest of a, of a hornet, they immediately, those hornets only live for whatever, a couple of weeks or a couple of months or whatever, they immediately start building a nest. They never built a nest before in their life. And the question is, are these, are they, these um, uh, not termites, I can't remember what they're called, uh, but they build these huge um, things in Nigeria and they're um, like nests and they're about 15 feet high and they have these pillars coming off them or whatever and they actually built it, the nest has inside has to be kept at 87 degrees right, right. Fahrenheit and they keep it at 87 degrees Fahrenheit and underneath this Attenborough guy used to do the documentaries for na nature stuff for the British and he was underneath and he says and here underneath and it's this huge air conditioning system that built this, this thing but none of these things know anything. So who's the architect? Who's the right, one that's right. got the plan? And that's where you see where this swarm intelligence, where where they they, they work as one, and they they're able to, or like when when ants cross rivers or something, you know, there were streams or something, they they all make a a, a, a bridge out of mm -hmm. ants, and they all go across and stuff like that. When you see that kind of stuff, where they all know exactly what they're going to do, or when a when a bee comes in and it tells the the bees not only how much. Uh, pollen there is in a certain area, what angle from the sun it is, how far it is away, all this kind of stuff where, and then all the other bees go there and they, 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 they start another hive and it's just, when you start looking at this intelligence, you start seeing this unbelievable intelligence in the universe and that if we can link people together, we can have that sort of, and, and you see a lot of, a lot of science is now looking, they've got departments on swarm intelligence to study how this works and how um, how we can use this to, to build stuff and to uh, advance technology is this ability to, to use this swarm, what they call swarm intelligence. Is it like a nanotechnology, small little little robots all working together, that kind of thing? Well, it's, it, it could be f with, with robots working together, but it's, it's, these, it's a concept that, that when, when, there are, when there's all these connections together, that they, it's much more powerful, like uh, geese are much more powerful. I didn't know this as well. I mean, when you go and you start studying all this stuff and you realize how magnificent nature is and how did, how did this actually happen, like with geese, because here we have the big uh, thing where the geese all come here, and there's 110,000 here in the, in, the, in the fall, and there's only like 700,000 people in the city, and they come and, and well, I went to the, the tour where they, they at the uh, place where all the geese land, there's 10,000 land on this one lake every night. And uh, they talked about the fact that when they go south, they move at 55 miles an hour. That's how fast they're flying. And they're up at like 24,000 feet. And that the young ones lead the, lead the, the, the front of the, 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 uh, the, the V. And how, how do they know which of the young ones? And they seem to know exactly what to do and how to, how, what day to leave and all this mm -hmm. kind of stuff. And when to come back. Like when I see them, they, they, like you, it's cold as hell. And you go like, you see two ducks and you're going, oh, what the hell are they going back? And within a couple of days, man, it's just like, it's warm. It's like, they know. Yeah, and and, it's, and it's, it's trying to be, tap into this thing that there's, there's this innate intelligence in everything. And that uh, by separating ourselves, by working against each other, that we don't. It's almost the idea of like, the analogy I always use is, is who wins the Super Bowl? 
It's not the team with the, with the superstar players. It's the ones where you go into a huddle and everybody knows exactly what they're supposed to do. And they mm. do exactly what they're supposed to do. And there's not everybody in the huddle saying, bullshit, I'm, not, I'm right, block, right. are you kidding? I'm going for a pass. Right. And that's what we're doing in our society is we're divided, where everybody's mm. doing their own thing. And it's like, don't tell me what to do and everybody's fighting or whatever. And I you know, make the joke about the United States is the idea, you, you used to be the United States of America, and you were great because you were the, the United States of America. Mm -hmm. You yes. are not great anymore because you are no longer united. And it's like they're at this civil war type thing, and you see this idea that, that the, the, when you work together, when you put it together, there's a lot of advantages and that you see throughout nature all these, these things working together, whereas the idea of evolution is they're all fighting against each other, and it's not. It's when you see, uh, especially with uh, like bees and Stuff like that. I was always amazed with bees. At the unbelievable, or or when they had this thing where they where they built these huge fifteen foot things where they he breaks the one the one tower off this thing, and these things all just they start building this thing immediately. <laughs> they never built before. They're they're busy looking after eggs or whatever, and they just suddenly change jobs and they all start building this this thing. And they know exactly. Or like when the queen dies in a in a in a, in a beehive, all the cells are a certain hexagon things which I can tell you the story about Chris, these hexagon things, and they're all the same size, but the bee, the queen bee, is in a bigger one, so as soon as the queen dies, they immediately build a, a, a thing to put the egg in there, and then they give it this uh, royal jelly to feed it, to make it into a queen, and they know exactly what to do, and they know how to, make, how to, make, how, how to build that thing. Crazy.